Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Chapman, and I'm a member of the National Transportation Safety Board. Welcome to our webinar that will focus on a safe system approach to motorcycle safety. No one's a greater risk of losing their life on our roads than vulnerable road users. That includes anyone who's not in a vehicle, pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorcycle riders, among others. In 2020, over one third of all roadway deaths were vulnerable road users, the highest level since 1975, which is when the government started tracking. That's why protecting vulnerable road users through a safe system approach is on the NTSB's most wanted list of transportation safety improvements. In 2020, 5,579 motorcyclists died in traffic crashes, an 11% increase from 2019, accounting for 14% of all fatalities that year. May is Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month. With warmer weather, motorcyclists who have been cooped up will be eager to get out on the road again. Both motorcyclists and motorists need to be extra cautious. This month is dedicated to reminding motorcyclists and motorists that safe driving, riding practices, and cooperation from all road users is needed. However, to get us to zero fatalities and serious injuries on the nation's roads, we need to do more. The NTSB has called for the adoption of the safe system approach. A key principle of the safe system approach is that road safety is a shared responsibility. Today, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers who will look at motorcycle safety through the lens of this approach. They will talk about NTSB crash investigations and safety recommendations, vehicle design and technology for both motorcycles and passenger vehicles, infrastructure needs, driver training and protective gear, and safe driving and riding practices to improve safety for motorcyclists. One life lost on our roads is one too many. More than 5,000 motorcyclists killed on our roads every year is completely unacceptable, and these deaths are preventable. As you listen to our speakers and the discussion today, I encourage you to look for where you can share the responsibility for improving road safety for our most vulnerable road users. Thank you for joining us for this important discussion. Thank you, Member Chapman, for your opening remarks and for your work to advocate for the safe system approach and improving safety for vulnerable road users. If you'd like to learn more about the NTSB Most Wanted list, please visit ntsb.gov forward slash MWL. Today, we have invited experts who will discuss the risk factors for motorcyclists and the countermeasures needed to improve safety using a safe system approach. Our presenters today include Mike Fox from NTSB. Mike will provide an overview of our most wanted list, the safe system approach, NTSB crash investigations and safety recommendations related to improving motorcycle safety. Guan Xu from the Federal Highway Administration will review their latest infrastructure projects to improve safety for motorcyclists and share how they have adopted the safe system approach. Eric Teo from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety will describe their work on ABS and vehicle safety technology. Mike Sayer from the American Motorcyclist Association will offer the rider perspective and share how AMA is working with industry and regulators to improve safety. And finally, we will have Lee Parks from Total Control Training who will cover rider training, rider protection, and other safety countermeasures. I'm excited for the presentations in our conversation today and happy to welcome our first guest, Mike Fox. Mike is a senior highway crash investigator on the NTSB's East Coast team, East Go team assigned to headquarters and specializes in motor carrier factors, operations, and motorcycle safety. 
Mike has over 30 years experience in commercial trucking safety systems and regulatory oversight and was an investigator at FMCSA before joining the NTSB. Mike has been riding motorcycles for over 35 years and is a strong advocate for motorcycle safety. Mike? Thank you, Stephanie. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. May is Motorcycle Awareness Month. With warmer weather, it's time to remind people to be alert and to share the road with motorcycles. An effective way that we can improve motorcycle safety is through the safe system approach. Today, I will cover the NTSB's most wanted list. I will then discuss what is the safe system approach. Next, I will review some motorcycle statistics. Then I will briefly review two motorcycle crash investigations. Lastly, I will discuss how we can share the responsibility for improving motorcycle safety. Every two years, the NTSB publishes the most wanted list, which highlights transportation safety improvements needed now to prevent accidents and crashes, reduce injuries, and save lives in all modes. The list includes five highway items, implement a comprehensive strategy to eliminate speeding related crashes, eliminate distracted driving, prevent alcohol and drug impaired driving, require collision avoidance and connected vehicle technologies on all vehicles, and lastly, protect vulnerable road users through a safe system approach. When we say vulnerable road users or VRUs, we're talking about pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorcyclists. Unlike other, vehicle, other motor vehicles, VRUs lack an external structure to protect them when crashes occur, and they're more likely to suffer a serious injury or even death. Proven effective countermeasures are being underutilized at the federal, state, and local levels to protect pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorcyclists. The NTSB has been concerned with the threat to VRUs. In 2018 and 2019, we published three reports on the risks to this vulnerable population and issued more than 30 new safety recommendations focused on reducing VRUs or traffic deaths. The safe system approach consists of six principles and five elements. The first principle focuses on injury severity. From the onset, we seek to eliminate death and serious injury. In exchange, there is a willingness to accept some crashes with less severity. No death or serious injury is acceptable. It assumes that we all make mistakes. The emphasis on the methods to prevent these mistakes from causing deaths or serious injuries. Human vulnerabilities are accommodated by managing kinetic energy through engineering, design, and policy. We acknowledge that road safety is a shared responsibility among road users, designers, planners, engineers, corporations, and policymakers. The five elements are safe road users, safe vehicles, safe speeds, safe roads, and post-crash care. You'll be hearing from four excellent speakers on some of these elements. Here, I would like to use one example to illustrate how the safe system approach works. With a strong safety culture across all levels, from individuals to federal government, we address the safety needs of all of our road users, not just drivers. Because we understand that all road users will make mistakes, we double down on what works. For example, we advocate for well-designed and properly worn seat belts for all seating positions. At the same time, we promote vehicle technologies that already exist, such as automatic emergency braking and lane departure technology. We should accelerate development and adaptation of additional advanced driver-assisted systems or ADAS. There are also road designs that can create safer environment for vulnerable road users. These include separating vehicular traffic from bicyclists and pedestrians, such as separated bike lanes 
and separate traffic signal timing for pedestrians and motor vehicles. Because we know that injury severity is tied to kinetic energy, which is proportional to speed, we need to rethink how speed management works. Our roadways are over-designed to accommodate mobility, not safety. It's critical to move forward using roadway design to better manage driver safe speed and to rethink how speed limits are set. Many of these tools already are here and we need to integrate, we need to have an integrative approach. So how bad are the numbers? Well, let's take a look. Here is a graphic detailing US transportation fatalities in 2020 by mode. It's very telling. On the left side, we can see that in 2020, there were almost 39,000 fatalities in highway. In comparison to the other modes, rail, marine, aviation, and pipeline, who are setting the example and are well on their way to reaching zero. If you add up the total number, um, number of VRU fatalities, it equals 12,926. So we have a lot of work to do. Let's drill down a little further into the data. Here is a snapshot of motorcyclists killed and injured over the past nine years. In 2020, the fatalities reflected the highest number of motorcyclists killed since NHTSA has been maintaining the data. In 2020, there were 5,579 motorcyclists killed and over 82,000 injured. These numbers are unacceptable. We have to do better. As mentioned, in 2020, there were 5,779 motorcyclists that were fatally injured, an increase of 11% from 2019. Motorcyclist deaths accounted for 14% of all highway fatalities. You're 28 times more likely to be killed on a motorcycle than in a passenger vehicle, and four times more likely to be injured. Motorcyclists 55 years old and older accounted for 27% of the motorcyclists killed in 2020. Of the 2020 motorcyclist fatalities, 29% were alcohol impaired, the highest impairment than the other vehicle types. It was 20% for cars, 19% for light trucks, and 2% for large trucks. Lastly, 34% of all motorcycle fatalities in 2020 were due to speeding. Now let's look at a crash study. This first crash we're going to take a look at took place in Augusta, Maine on September the 10th in 2017. An estimated 3,000 motorcyclists gathered at the Augusta Civic Center in Augusta, Maine to participate in the annual United Bikers of Maine Toy Run, a charity event. As the toy run began, the large number of motorcyclists merging onto the interstate caused a traffic queue on northbound Interstate 95 between exits 112B and 113. There was no traffic control, no lane closure, or law enforcement present on Interstate 95 to provide warning, management, or protection of the queue of motorcyclists. In the initial stages of the crash sequence, as shown on the left graphic, vehicle one traveled from the right lane across two lanes into the path of vehicle number two, the pickup truck. After the, these two vehicles collided, the pickup truck veered across the center line into the right lane and struck vehicle number three. Three other motorcycles, vehicles four through six, were subsequently involved in the crash or also numbered. The pickup truck then went through the right guardrail, overturned and came to rest on its passenger side, shown by the red arrow. On the right graph, vehicle one traveled through the guardrail and came to rest on its right side in a ditch beside the pickup truck. Vehicle three came to rest on the right shoulder next to the guardrail. Here are two photos showing the vehicles at final rest shown by the red arrows. As a result of this crash, the operators of vehicle one and vehicle three were fatally injured. 
Seven other motorcyclists received various injuries ranging from serious to minor. In this crash, we can see there were several failures due to lack of a safe system approach from the safe road user, as well as the safe roads perspective. We determined the crash was caused by the motorcycle operator's unsafe maneuver in moving in front of the pickup truck. We also identified that the Augusta Police Department and the Toy Run Organizer, the United Bikers of Maine, lacked a safety plan to identify and mitigate the risks associated with routing a group onto an interstate. Lastly, there was no supplemental traffic control or state police oversight on the interstate during the toy run. We issued two recommendations. The first was to the city of Augusta. Include in your city ordinance a requirement that all organizations seeking city approval to conduct a parade or special event involving roadway use create a safety plan that includes, at a minimum, the following elements safe route selection, acquisition of all required permits, and hazard mitigation. We issued a similar recommendation to the United Bikers of Maine. This is our second case study. This crash occurred on June the 21st at about 6.30 p.m. on State Route 2 in Randolph, New Hampshire. The crash involved a pickup truck hauling an automobile trailer and 13 motorcyclists. At the time of the crash, it was daylight clear and the roadway was dry. Here is an aerial view of the crash site. A group of 15 motorcycles departed the Mount Jefferson View Inn, were traveling east on US Highway 2, shown here by the yellow line. As the vehicles approached, the truck entered the oncoming eastbound lane of traffic and collided with multiple motorcycles before coming to rest on an embankment. I apologize. All right, stay right there. Uh, this photo shows the pickup truck and two motorcycles at final rest. The motorcycles are circled in yellow. As the vehicles approached, the truck entered the oncoming eastbound lane of traffic and collided with multiple motorcycles before coming to rest on an embankment on the eastbound shoulder. Immediately after the impact, a post-crash fire ensued. As a result of the crash, seven motorcyclists were killed and one sustained serious injury. Again, this crash, in this crash, we can see that there were several failures due to the lack of a safe system approach. The 23-year-old truck driver had a known history of drug abuse. Post-crash toxicology showed he had fentanyl, heroin, and cocaine in his system. The levels of those substances indicate the driver had used drugs within 12 hours of the crash. The pickup truck drivers crossing the center line occurred because of his impairment from multiple drugs. The pickup truck driver had a suspended license and should not have been allowed to drive. The motor carrier failed to qualify the crash involved driver and the manager of the carrier tampered with logging device and falsified his hours of service records. Post crash, four of the six riders tested positive for alcohol. The lead rider in the formation who was killed had a BAC above New Hampshire's per se limit of 0.08 grams per deciliter. Some of the riders were not wearing helmets or wearing non-DOT compliant helmets. We were encouraged that several motorcycles were equipped with ABS, which helped those riders maintain stability during the crash. We made recommendations to the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles to improve the processing of interstate licensing notifications and to the FMCSA recommendations to improve the oversight of motor carriers. We reiterated recommendations to NHTSA to require all new motorcycles manufactured for on-road use in the US to be equipped with ABS technology. 
to the three states that have no helmet laws, Illinois, Iowa, and New Hampshire, require all persons to wear a Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard or FMVSS 218 compliant motorcycle helmet while operating a motorcycle or as a passenger on any motorcycle. The same recommendation was reiterated to, to 27 states with partial helmet laws. Now we'll play a short video courtesy of the Motorcycle Safety Foundation. Spending an afternoon riding your motorcycle is one of the best things you can do. I mean, it's so great for your body and your soul and your mind, and it's just such a fun way to spend an afternoon. As motorcyclists, our profiles are much narrower, and that means a lot of car and truck drivers don't see us right away. So a good strategy to use is to ride as if you're invisible. Driving is a full-time task, and Tripoli would like to remind car and truck drivers that it doesn't allow for distractions. You can't have distractions while you're driving because it could have deadly consequences. It's important to be aware of where motorcyclists are because motorcycles are, are smaller in profile. So take a second look before changing lanes. Sometimes we forget about these simple skills that we have and simple courtesies, and it will really be helpful to other riders and drivers on the road just by using your turn signals before changing lanes. So let's be patient with one another out there, whether you're a driver, a motorcyclist, pedestrian, or bicyclist. We all want to look out for each other because we're a big community out on the road. So what can we do to move the needle towards zero? Well, here are a couple of solutions. If you're a motorcyclist, gear up. Wear a DOT approved helmet. Ride alcohol and drug free. If you're a motorcycle, if you're a motorist, be aware of your surroundings, check blind spots, use your signals when changing lanes. Don't drive distracted or impaired and don't speed. If you're a government official, include motorcycles in your policies, procedures, and regulations. If you are a motorcycle club, make sure if you're organizing a rally or motorcycle run to implement a safety plan that includes proper route planning with law enforcement and traffic control. And if you're a safety professional, please visit our website to learn more about these and other crash investigations and recommendations. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mike. Now I would like to introduce Guan Xu. Guan has over 30 years experience in the transportation profession. She has worked for government agencies, including FHWA, state DOTs, city government, and the Metropolitan Planning Organization, and consultant firms in the fields of roadway design, operations, safety, and planning. She joined FHWA in 2003 to become a member of the MUC team in the Office of Transportation Operations, and then moved to the Office of Safety Technologies in 2005 to manage the highway rail grade crossing program, and later changed to managing the speed management and the motorcycle safety programs. Welcome, Guan. Guan, we are unable to hear you. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I uh, forgot to unmute. Um, I need to move my slides to the first one. It's not moving. Uh, let me... Uh, Share it one more time.
Okay, I'm sorry. Um, no. Okay, sorry, I think I'm back on track. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, sorry about the, the, uh, the hiccups. Um, my presentation today will focus on some major efforts. Can you hear me? Huh? Yes, we can hear you, Gwen. Okay, sorry. Um, I will focus on um, some major efforts that Federal Highway Administration has been taking to address the infrastructure and the engineering issues of uh, concern to motorcycle safety. Uh, which involves two of the uh, five elements of safe system approach, uh, safe roads and safe speeds. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, some, you know, briefly some talking about some background information and then get into motorcycle advisory council related activities, uh, followed by uh, collaborative efforts among federal highway administration and the stakeholders on motorcycle safety improvement practices and research. First, I would like to highlight the US Department of uh, uh, Transportation National Roadway Safety Strategy that was released uh, in late January. The NRSS outlines the department's comprehensive approach to significantly uh, reducing serious injuries and uh, death on our nation's roadways. This strategic uh, document was timely because it offers an overarching framework to improve safety and realize the goal of Region Zero. It de describes a department-wide adoption. It also describes a department-wide adoption of a safe system approach, which focuses on five key objectives: uh, safe safer people, safer roads, safer vehicles, safer speeds, and post-crash care. Um, as member chairman and Mike uh, just mentioned that in 2020, more than uh, 5,500 motorcyclists were killed in traffic crashes, which is 11% increase from 2019, and it accounts for 14% of total traffic fatalities. It is obvious that uh, in the efforts to uh, achieve zero fatality, safety issues involving uh, motorcyclists will need to be both recognized and addressed. Uh, the, the Congress has also recognized this specific safety challenge and called for uh, through the FAST Act, the establishment of Motorcyclist Advisory Council to coordinate with and advise the Federal Highway Administrator on infrastructure issues of concern to motorcyclists. And it also specified three subject areas of those concerns. Uh, first is, um, barrier design, and second is road design, construction, and maintenance practices. And the third is the, uh, the uh, architecture and the implementation of uh, intelligent transportation system technologies. Uh, the MAC was formally established in July 2017 with 10 members and a sunset in October 2020. With about two and a half years of hard work, in early 2020, the MAC produced its recommendations to the Secretary of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration with specific suggestions for each of the topic areas that specified in the FAST Act. Here's the, the list of some key MAC recommendations. They included first to develop criteria for testing and implementing barrier system that could protect motorcyclists together with other type of vehicles. Uh, second, to um, conduct research into including motorcycle as a type of a design vehicle for roadway design manual specifications. And third is, uh, is to provide training to road agencies on the unique roadway operating and the maintenance requirements and the risks motorcyclists face and to promote countermeasures to mitigate uh, those risks. And the first one uh, is to include motorcycle 
as the uh, specific vehicle class for ITS technology applications. Um, upon receiving the MAC recommendations, the Federal Highway Administration took immediate action and conducted a research project to address those uh, recommendations. And the project has re resulted in several products. The first, uh, the first one uh, focused on the uh, recommendation related to the barrier design. Um, the Federal Highway completed the uh, synthesis on barrier design for motorcycle risk safety. The synthesis uh, identified and summarized several new uh, barriers and the retrofit systems currently used or under development that are specifically intended to improve motorcycle risk safety. And also include information on testing parameters that should be investigated for developing standards in the United States. Um, the, uh, the second uh, synthesis that, uh, that produced uh, under this project uh, is to address motorcycle list uh, safety concerns related to the road, road geometric design, uh, the geometric design, construction, and maintenance. And the study investigated the specific areas of, of geometric and uh, pavement design that should change to better accommodate motorcycle list. And this also uh, includes information on the construction and maintenance issues related to motorcycles. Uh, motorcyclists and their uh, specific issues have been largely overlooked in the discussion of connected and automated vehicle technologies and applications. Uh, to raise awareness of this issue, the uh, project team uh, conducted focus group meetings and developed uh, synthesis that specifically investigated in details, those technology areas related to the motorcycle uh, safety concerns. A lot of the three uh, study also identified, identified areas of safety concern, concerns that uh, could potentially be enhanced or mitigated and uh, also recommended research topics to address uh, significant gaps and the needs for further improvements. Uh, after working with several state DOTs, we also identified nine noteworthy practices that uh, demonstrate how some safety improvement countermeasures has been implemented by some state DOTs and, and uh, can be adapted by other states to improve motorcycle safety. And we've scheduled a, a webinar for those states to present their uh, successful practices. And the webinar is going to be take place on June 7. Um, one of the MAC recommendations is to uh, disseminate, um, sorry, disseminate information, uh, information and, and the noteworthy practice to states and uh, uh, collaborate with states through AASHTO. Uh, we are currently working with AASHTO uh, to schedule a workshop in, con in conjunction with uh, a uh, AASHTO annual meeting. The purpose of the uh, joint workshop is to uh, share the products uh, from the studies I just mentioned and the noteworthy practices, and to find out what issues and challenges that uh, states face while developing and implementing uh, state policies and the and, and strategies for um, motorcycle uh, list safety. And, and also I'd like to exchange information on what resources and technical assistance they need and uh, what practice and uh, uh, countermeasures they have implemented that can be you know, shared with other states. As you may already know that a, strate a strategic highway safety plan is a major component and requirement of the, of the highways uh, safety improvement program. SHSP identifies a state's key, key uh, safety needs and guides investment decisions towards safety improvements. According to uh, Federal Highways SHSP database, uh, 24 states have identified in their SSP, SHSP, 
identify motorcycle and motorcyclist safety, either as a standing alone uh, MSS area or be part of other MSS areas, which means that almost half of the states have recognized the importance of improving motorcyclist safety and have planned to take actions. Several of those uh, states have uh, participated in a transportation pool, pool fund study to identify, analyze, and develop solutions to improve motorcycle list related roadside hardware. Uh, one of the uh, proven safety countermeasures is road safety audit. Uh, Federal Highway Administration uh, uh, sponsored a motorcycle road safety audit case study project. Uh, with a multidisciplinary team, including motorcyclists and their advocates, in addition to subject matter uh, experts, the project conducted three uh, road safety audit case studies for road segments that had a high frequency of crashes involving motorcyclists. The case studies demonstrated how motorcycle safety was incorporated into the RSA process, and it also um, demonstrates that agencies are seeking specific measures to address the uh, safety of motorcyclists. One, relate, one relatively large scale of uh, um, federal heavy nutrition research effort concerning motorcyclist safety is the motorcycle crash causation study. The MCCS is the most comprehensive data collection effort to investigate the the causes, rider uh, demographics, and the opportunities for countermeasure development in the United States in more than 30 years. It's uh, a major collaborative effort among several key uh, motorcycle safety stakeholders, uh, including agencies from US DOT, state DOTs, and the motorcycle community. The project produced a, a wealth of information on the causal factors of uh, uh, motorcycle crashes and then provides uh, perspectives on what crash countermeasure opportunities, opportunities can be developed. Uh, you can find details, uh, detailed information from the three reports that were produced from the uh, uh, study. There are two other motorcycle safety related research that uh, I'd like also like to mention. Uh, one of them was funded by the Federal Highway Administration through the uh, SBRR program. Uh, this project aimed to uh, develop a uh, GPS based uh, system for bolstering awareness with real time rider alerting and queuing for upcoming danger avoidance. Barracuda is the abbreviation for the system. Basically, uh, the system is designed and developed to track and provide alerts in real time for specific hazards that uh, might exist uh, within motorcyclist riding environment. The second research project was uh, is the uh, NCHRP project 2226 uh, titled uh, factors related to serious injuries and, and fetal motorcycle crashes with traffic barriers. The study focused on guardrail, concrete, and cable barrier collisions and the factors that influence uh, injuries. Well, uh, the, the, the MAC uh, established under the uh, FAST Act, sunset in October 2020, uh, the new heavy bill of the uh, uh, bipartisan infrastructure law reauthorized the establishment of MAC. Uh, so our collaborative efforts will be continuing and marching towards achieving the goal of zero motorcyclist fatality. Uh, with that, um, that's uh, um, you know end my. Um, Presentation here is uh, Federal Highway Motorcycle Safety Program website, where you can find additional information and also uh, my contact info. If you have any questions after the webinar, uh, just feel free to contact me. With that, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Stephanie.
Well, and thank you for, for sharing all of the great work that you are um, working on at Federal Highway and the collaborative efforts that you all have ongoing to improve motorcycle safety. Next, I would like to introduce Eric Teo. Eric is the Director of Statistical Services at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. Since joining the Institute in 2006, he has conducted numerous studies quantifying the state of highway safety and identifying ways to improve it. His research has focused on motorcycles, young drivers, large trucks, and passenger vehicle safety. Welcome, Eric. Thank you very much for the introduction, Stephanie. Let me figure out how to use these slides real quick. Okay, hopefully you're looking at the right screen now. Um, thanks for, again, for this opportunity to talk about our work on uh, technology on vehicles and motorcycle safety. Uh, I think it's an important topic as is approaching motorcycle safety from all angles. Let me begin with what's known as the Haddon Matrix, named after a guy named Bill Haddon, who was one of the early presidents of my organization and a founder of what became the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. This is a framework for organizing our thoughts on reducing harm from motor vehicle crashes, both in terms of looking at the problems and their countermeasures or solutions. Now I'm here, I've taken the liberty of highlighting the important cells of this matrix, which is conveniently all of them. This is kind of the essence of the safe system approach is to approach uh, reducing harm from all angles, not just from one. That said, my talk today is going to focus on this cell, which would be the technology we put on vehicles uh, in preventing crashes, in some cases making them less severe. So when we talk about technology and motorcycle safety, we're really talking about two different sets of technology, shall we say. We have technology that we put on the motorcycles, and we have technology that is on passenger vehicles that can benefit motorcycles. So I'll be talking about, for the first one, anti-lock brakes on motorcycles, and for technology on cars, I'll be talking about how the various systems we have could benefit motorcycles. So for ABS, you know, this is a demonstration we did on our test track, showing that if you are in an emergency situation, slam on the brakes, it's not very difficult to lock a wheel and fall and have a very bad crash. But with ABS, it, it helps you maintain control of the motorcycle in these unfortunate situations. So we've done some prior research on this. We looked at uh, the effect of ABS on fatal crashes and on collision insurance losses. So for fatal crashes, uh, we've observed pretty large benefits. Um, about a third of fatal crashes could be prevented by ABS. And for collision insurance losses, which is basically damage to your own vehicle type of claims, which tend to be much less severe than fatal, we're seeing about a 20% benefit. And one of the things we were able to do in that study was repeat the notion that that safer riders choose to buy ABS and then that's why we're seeing the benefit. So we're pretty confident that ABS is really helping riders. So as a result of that, back in 2013, we formally petitioned NHTSA to mandate ABS on all new motorcycles for on-road use. Um, that hasn't happened, but it has been mandated in all EU member states and several other countries. And another important thing that's happened since this time is that the riding community has embraced ABS a lot more. Uh, there used to be a sort of an attitude of, I'm a good rider, I don't need this. And I think that's changing. People recognize, yes, I'm a good rider, but in an emergency situation, why not have something that will help? So as a result of all these things, ABS has become just far more common in the motorcycle fleet. Uh, it's on more than half of new motorcycles sold in the last year. And that's a really big uh, benefit for motorcycles. So let me talk to you a little bit now about our updated study that we did last year. 
So like I mentioned, we did two other studies. These tiny little tables are the study bikes that we had. But since it's become more common, this is now our table of study bikes. So the advantage here is we have a much broader sample of the motorcycle population. Um, our results are not just dominated by one motorcycle or something like that. And we were also able to break down the effectiveness of ABS by type of motorcycle, which we have right here. So as you can see here, basically there's a trend that the sportier the motorcycle, the smaller the benefit of ABS. But it's important to note that they're all benefits. And you know, when we look at motorcycles overall, we're seeing a 22% reduction associated with having ABS. And that's a really important thing. We don't always have effects as large as 20 something percent in the field of highway safety. So ABS is a really important technology. Now switching gears a little bit, you know, we did this other study looking at, well, we have all this technology on cars. What happens if it sees motorcycles? as it should. Um, there's a lot of different advanced uh, driver assistance features available right now, uh, lane departure systems, forward collision warning, cross traffic alert, all kinds of different things. And, you know, we studied three classes of these. We looked at front crash prevention, which warns you if you're approaching something too quickly and don't take evasive action. Uh, some systems issue a warning like it beeps at you. Uh, other systems, if you don't respond to the warning, will automatically apply the brakes, in some cases bringing the vehicle to a complete stop to avoid the crash or make it less severe. We also studied lane maintenance systems. Um, typically, the way these work is monitoring the lane lines and beep at you if you're about to depart the lane without doing so deliberately, as in giving a turn signal. Um, some systems will actively steer the vehicle to keep you in the lane. And the last set we looked at is blind spot detection, which um, warns you if there's a vehicle next to you, typically by illuminating a light to the mirror. And if you steer toward that vehicle or give a turn signal toward that, it will be at you and warn you so that you don't sideswipe somebody. So here's an example of motorcycle crash that we think could have benefited from crash of winds technology. Um, I do want to point out the rider's not injured here. I didn't show that. But let's take a look. Now, I mean, the bike falls to the ground, but keep in mind, that could be thousands of dollars. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Oh my God. Oh my God, Jacob. And uh, if you notice, she called him by name. This was his mother who struck him with her car. And uh, while there's a certain amusement in that, another important thing to keep in mind is this crash could have been much more severe and, you know, wouldn't have been uh, anything to joke about. But also looking at this, if mom had a forward collision warning system in her car, and if that system detected the motorcycle, there may have been no crash here whatsoever. He would have gone along on his wonderful ride that day and you know, had a much better day probably. So the way we did the study was looking at different types of crashes that could have been avoidable had vehicles had certain technology. So for front crash prevention, this is basically crashes in which the passenger vehicle rear ends the motorcycle when they're traveling in the same direction. For lane maintenance systems, um, this would be where the car unintentionally departs their lane. And we also looked at higher speed loads because that's where these systems tend to work. I mentioned something about detecting motorcycles, but for lane maintenance, uh, there's no such thing as detecting motorcycles. The system just has to work well and keep the car in its way. And lastly, for blind spot, the crash type here was same direction sideswipe, where the passenger vehicle intentionally changed lanes. 
And in terms of crash numbers, here we've got on the left-hand side fatal crashes, on the right-hand side police reported crashes by number of vehicles. So the green portions of these bars are what we studied in this study, which is two vehicle crashes between one passenger vehicle and one motorcycle. And that accounts for the majority of multiple vehicle crashes. But keep in mind, you know, about 40 some percent of motorcycle crashes are single vehicle. So back to that theme of we all have a role to play. Yes, these technologies can address the green bars, but motorcyclists have a role to play in addressing the blue bars. Now here's the results of that study. In terms of the percent of two vehicle crashes that could be addressed by at least one of those three technology groups, we're looking at 10% of fatal crashes and close to a quarter of police reported crashes, motorcycles, um, two vehicle crashes. We take into account that there are single vehicle and three plus vehicle crashes. You know, the percentages go down a bit, but 4% of fatal crashes and 10% of all crashes reported to police, that's still a lot. Um, so, you know, these technologies, they have, an, they have a big opportunity to help motorcycle, not motorcyclists. Now, one other thing that came out of looking at all these crash types was looking at crash types that may or may not be relevant to the technologies we study. So for instance, the passenger vehicle rear-ending the motorcyclist is relevant, but the motorcyclist rear-ending the passenger vehicle is not relevant to the car's technology. But it was interesting to look at which of these was more common. It turns out motorcycle rear-ending car is more common than the other way around. So again, that theme of we all have a role to play. Another interesting finding was looking at which of these crash types is more common, turning left in front of an oncoming vehicle. Was it the car or the motorcycle that did this more frequently? It was the car by a lot. This single crash type accounted for nearly a third of the fatal two vehicle crashes in motorcycles and almost a fifth of the ones reported to police. Just this one crash type. A very similar crash type is instead of the motorcycle oncoming, the motorcycle coming from the left, the car turning left in front of that. That was 9% of the time. So these two crash types, these account for, you know, almost 40% of the two vehicle crashes and over a quarter of the ones reported to police. Luckily, uh, Going back to technology, these crash types are addressable by some technology, especially that one on the left for the oncoming vehicle case. This technology, which is available on some vehicles now, is called left turn assist. And it basically uses the same hardware as front crash prevention, but pays attention to the oncoming traffic during the left turn situation. And if you try to go when it is unsafe, it will at least warn you or maybe even apply the brakes and stop you from doing that. So these things are being tested in Europe under their new car assessment program. And there's a really strong need for these systems to detect motorcycles specifically. So that was the result of a conference paper I submitted recently. Um, this updated the numbers from that um, technology study to the latest five years of data, focusing on the issue of left turn crashes for motorcycles and discussing the potential that left turn assist has. And lastly, um, you know, these technologies I've been talking about are all crash avoidance technologies, but I wanted to say something about driving automation technology and, and, and motorcycles. So just like the crash avoidance technologies, these things, they need to detect motorcycles, they need to work. Okay, and that's kind of the baseline. When we talk about something like an autonomous vehicle, like, you know, sit down and say, hey, car, take me to the store. We think that once those are out there, that's probably gonna be okay because there's a very high barrier for success to be able to have that functionality. But before we get there, Testing these things, testing prototypes of these on public roads is a source of concern. 
because that's not the final product that may not have the same functionality, that may not have the same safeguards. So that's a potential issue. Another issue is the um, what's known as level two driving automation, which is sort of a partial automation that relies on the driver to constantly monitor the situation and take over if necessary. And this is of particular concern because these are vehicles right now that you can go by and there's a tendency for drivers to over trust these. There's currently no safety case for using such technology. Uh, we don't know that using a level two automation system is any safer than driving manually. And if drivers over trust it, it may be worse. So one thing we are doing pretty soon is releasing a rating system for these technologies that focuses on um, how the vehicle monitors the driver and make sure that they are paying attention. So the conclusions I have are, you know, ABS in particular really, really helps riders. And as you've seen from some other examples, there may be opportunity to develop other types of rider assistance technologies that will help further. Passenger vehicle technologies can benefit motorcycles if they detect motorcycles and if they function well. We've got to specifically address left turn crashes for motorcycles. That is just a big topic that deserves its own attention. And lastly, kind of going back to the safe systems idea, all the stuff I've talked about with technology you know, as much as it helps, it doesn't remove the need to do anything else. You know, we still have to improve human performance, especially in human behavior. Uh, none of the numbers I showed you were 100% reductions, so there will still be motorcycle crashes. And there's therefore still a need for riders to protect themselves with uh, protective equipment. And also there are opportunities for infrastructure countermeasures. So here's my uh, contact info. If you have any questions or follow up that is not addressed in our Q&A afterwards, please feel free to contact me. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Eric, thank you for your presentation and for reminding us just how important um, vehicle technology is to getting us to zero. And then also reminding us that it is just one of the layers of safety within a safe system approach. Um, thank you for your presentation. Pleasure. I would like to now introduce Mike Sayer. Mike is the Director of Government Relations for the American Motorcyclist Association. In this role, he represents the interests of millions of on and off-road motorcyclists at the local, state, and federal levels of government. Mike also served as the chair of the Motorcyclist Advisory Council charged with providing recommendations to the US DOT on infrastructure issues of concern to motorcyclists, such as road design, construction, and maintenance practices, as well as barrier design and the inclusion of motorcyclists in intelligent transportation systems. He is also a rider himself with over 10 years of riding experience. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Seth. I bring up my screen here. Here. All right. Um, well, I am Michael Sayer. Um, I am the Director of Government Relations for the American Motorcyclist Association. Um, I'm going to touch on some of the things that Eric just touched on more from the rider's perspective, um, as well as some similar technology now being applied to motorcycles themselves. Um, but first, um, um, at Mike Fox's request, I wanted to introduce the American Motorcyclist Association. We are the largest motorcycling organization in the country, um, one of the largest in the world. Um, we were founded in 1924, um, and when we were spun off of the uh, uh, industry association at the time to manage rider registration and sanction national events, recreational competition, uh, on-road and off-road. There were all, all kinds of racing and recreational events then as there are today. Um, it wasn't until the 1960s that we formed a formal legislative department, which has now become our government relations department that I had here in DC. We opened this office in the 1990s. Uh, we also operate the American Motorcycle Hall of Fame located at our headquarters just outside Columbus, Ohio in Pickerington. Um, 
I also want to highlight something that uh, we are often called the Motorcycle Association, the Motorcyclists Association. Um, but in 1976, we officially changed our name from the American Motorcycle Association to the American Motorcyclist Association to accurately reflect the fact that we represent the people on the machines, not the machines themselves. Um, today, the mission of the American Motorcyclist Association is to promote the motorcycle lifestyle and protect the future of motorcycle. Um, uh, at the bottom there, you can see uh, some of our logos throughout the years. On the far right is our very earliest logo, that uh, red, green, and yellow swirl there. Um, a, the middle logo is something we used in the you know, late 90s, 2000s, I believe, and the, uh, that other logo there we used a variation on um, over most of our history. Um, I did want to call out um, this, uh, the, the fact that President Biden issued a statement acknowledging May as Motorcycle Safety and Awareness Month. As far as we're aware, this is the first time a president has done that, so we really wanted to highlight that, um, noting that motorcycling is more than a mode of transportation for motorcyclists. It's often a way of life, um, noting the uh, need to continue the work of the Motorcyclist Advisory Council to get the new council seated, as uh, Guan noted earlier. Um, and as a theme throughout this, um, everybody's presentation today, that road safety is a sheer responsibility for all road users. Um, to address some of the things that Eric was talking about when it comes to advanced driver assistance systems from the perspective of motorcyclists, uh, the AMA has long advocated that um, motorcycles need to be included in the research development of these features, as well as intelligent transportation systems more broadly, whether that's smart infrastructure, connected vehicles, and you know, in particular, automated vehicles. Um, as Eric has hinted, research on some of these things um, shows that detecting motorcycles is, is a challenge, whether it's detecting too late for the driver to intervene or not at all, uh, there are shown to be consistent issues, something that is true for other vulnerable road users. And I do want to note for just a moment, there are some, there are some in the, as I'm trying to speak for the motorcycling community, there are some in the motorcycling community that don't particularly like that label, vulnerable road users, mostly because they consider themselves as a full motor vehicle having all the same rights and responsibilities as any other car, truck, or other motor vehicle on the road and being lumped in with, with pedestrians and bicyclists that are road users as well that don't have the uh, same, uh, you know, different rights and responsibilities as other motor vehicles. Um, it's something the AMA doesn't have say, a formal position on, but we do want to highlight that, um, that we are anything that would necessarily reduce our ability to use the roadways is something we're always deeply concerned about. Um, recently, the uh, proposal to update the new car assessment program does acknowledge the need to include motorcycles in the testing of some of these features, um, but ultimately decides not to do so. Um, we have seen the, the Euro, European version of the new car assessment program um, has made the decision to include motorcycles in this testing, and I believe it is uh, for model year 23 going forward. So we're excited to see that. Um, it, as Eric said, it's really important for motorcycles to be included in the development of these systems. Um, as drivers become accustomed to them, they expect them to work properly. And especially as Eric entered the level two uh, systems, introduce a, a very strong possibility of drivers becoming too complacent with these systems that may not see other road users on the road and allowing them to have a false sense of security. Um, and in the longer term, these technologies we believe will be very foundational for the future development of automated vehicles. And so allowing them to continue development without having all road users safely detected and reacted to um, puts us on a uneven foundation going forward and that's something we would love to see addressed. Um, switching gears a little bit, talking about applying these systems to motorcycles, um, you know, these are images of my own motorcycle. Um, it is equipped with both blind spot monitoring. As you can see on the top, there is a rear facing radar, a little light in the side mirrors, just as many traditional passenger vehicles have um, to warn the rider when there's a vehicle approaching in one of their left or right blind spots. Um, it also has adaptive cruise control operated by the front facing radar you see there. Um, speaking for myself, um, I had the opportunity to test some of these technologies on a prototype bike at one developer's uh, test facility, um, which in a closed course setting um, after watching the professional engineers do so. And, and to be clear, I am certainly no engineer. Um, 
it was confidence inspiring to see how well these systems worked. And when it came time for me to uh, upgrade from a, a motorcycle I had purchased in 2012, that um, ABS was not even an option for getting a motorcycle that had kind of the highest level of safety technology was something I was certainly very interested in. Um, there are a lot of complications to applying any automotive technology to motorcycling. Um, you know, that started with ABS, which I'll get into um, in my next slide here, but for particularly with these, uh, these technologies, adapting radar for a motorcycle use required a lot of work by the engineers who did so. Obviously a motorcycle turns in a corner, so that radar that was previously flat kind of aimed at the horizon is suddenly aimed partially at the ground. Um, there's a lot of work that went into that to make that work. And with it, you know, in my conversations with developers, um, there's a lot of new ideas that we will see probably in the next three, four years maybe of other systems based on this. Now that the radar is incorporated, it works, um, what else can they use it for? And um, there's some discussions of automatic emergency braking, uh, adaptive cruise control in a large group of riders type setting um, where obviously you're following closer than you would a, another vehicle or packed more tightly than you would amongst other passenger motor vehicles, as well as different types of forward and rear collision warning systems. Um, one of the main issues for adapting this, these technologies is how to communicate any of that information to the rider. With things, passive warnings, you have the lights on the mirror, which can work, but again, that's somebody looking away from the road ahead of them to notice that light. Some warning on the dash the same way. You can't really have an audible warning. Some folks, myself included, will ride with a Bluetooth headset so I can, I can maybe connect to the bike and hear a warning that way, but that's not a guaranteed thing. And then that's a third party product going with the motorcycle itself. Um, you can't really have vibration the same way you would on a steering wheel or a driver seat in a car because you're on a vibrating big motorcycle. Um, it's hard to tell that way. So how to communicate these things to the rider is definitely a, a big challenge. And in my conversation with the engineers working on it, that is a big area of focus. Taking a step backwards, I want to talk about the early days of ABS and why some motorcyclists, even today, although as Eric pointed out, uh, perceptions are changing, sometimes have a negative view of anti-lock brakes. That motorcycle up there is an old BMW from I believe the late 80s is when it was first introduced. Um, this image is from I think 2013, so we're about 10 years past that. So 35 years ago, the first commercially available motorcycle equipped with ABS went on sale. The entire system weighed about 30 pounds, I believe. Um, didn't necessarily perform very well. It, um, I, I remember my first uh, passenger motor vehicle that had ABS. It was certainly a very jarring thing the first time it activated on a snowy road. And that being directly applied to a motorcycle would certainly be difficult. And in some cases, a, an experienced rider could, could outperform the ABS as well. Not today, you see the, the uh, object to the right of that uh, BMW up there is a modern ABS module, which is much, much smaller, probably the size of you know, a fist maybe. Um, but even as ABS has improved, early experiences continue to cast a long shadow on, on rider experience with them. Um, that said, today, it's as Eric pointed out, finding a motorcycle that doesn't have ABS as, as at least an option is getting more and more challenging. Even the smallest motorcycles are, um, you are able to find at least some version of ABS. Um, and with that, ABS on a motorcycle being far more complicated than it is on a car simply because, um, again, a motorcycle leans. The amount of braking force you can apply to a motorcycle while it's straight upright versus leaned over, as the image below shows, is very different. With new sensors and new technology in being included on the motorcycle, the motorcycle is able to be aware of how far it is leaned over and how much braking force it can actually apply before it starts to lose traction. This is known as cornering ABS to kind of differentiate itself from a more basic ABS that doesn't take those things into account. Um, more modern systems allow riders to adjust the function of ABS, whether it's in some cases turning it off entirely if you're going to be going to a racetrack or an off-road setting, or adjusting the level at which it, um, the intervention occurs and how much intervention itself occurs um, are sometimes adjustable on higher-end motorcycles. Um, and with that, other systems are there. Um, this diagram is uh, kind of a basic outline of the systems involved to um, fun, uh, allow ABS to work as well as traction control. And that 
the object below that is an inertial measurement unit. That is what allows the motorcycle to detect kind of where it is in space um, relating to how it's leaned over going forward, whether it's, you know, one end is higher than the other. Um, but these new newer features, which are um, have been a thing available in passenger vehicles for quite a while, are are now more and more available in, in motorcycles. Um, but again, are more complicated. You know, traction control in a in a motorcycle mainly controls the spinning of the rear wheel to prevent somebody from accidentally giving the motorcycle too much throttle in a situation where they may not have enough traction and suddenly the rear wheel going out from underneath them. Um, that functions by again the motorcycle because of the ABS feature there, that little object on the, on the rear wheel, that yellow ring at the front wheel, front and rear wheels detects how the wheels are spinning in relation to one another. If they notice the rear wheel is spinning much faster than the front one, it is able to cut throttle input to stop that rear wheel from spinning. Speaking of throttle, there are also different throttle modes um, to control just how much of the turn of the throttle translate in, translates into how much throttle is actually delivered to uh, the rear wheel. Um, similarly, there's wheelie control, simply prevent that front wheel from lifting too. Um, there's also electronic suspension, which is not as much a safety feature, it's more of a performance and comfort feature, but many of these features are sold to riders as both performance and comfort and sometimes safety. Um, yes, it is becoming more and more common um, on mid-range motorcycles to have a handful of these features. Often, once you have incorporated one of them, it gets easier to add another one on. And even at, as I said before, the cheapest motorcycles um, have at least sometimes, at least front or rear wheel ABS just on one wheel sometimes. And it's often, if it's not standard, it might be a $250, $300 option, um, which is far cheaper than it used to be. So as far as the motorcycling community accepting some of these safety features, again, I think it's getting easier to do, but that initial rider experience casts a long shadow. Um, a lot of motorcyclists um, talk to older, more experienced riders to get ideas on what they should and shouldn't do. And myths are hard to dispel um, in that kind of uh, situation. Um, there will always be early adopters. I, and somewhat that with my own motorcycle being one of the first available with front and rear radar. Um, but that's you can't count on that for uh, the community to necessarily accept it. Um, I still hear skepticism today um, on some of these systems, especially some things like ABS that is, as Eric has pointed out, long proven track record at this point. Um, the role of the motorcycle in the in the rider's life, what they're using it for and the type of riding to do plays, I think, probably a very significant role in their openness to this. If somebody is commuting to work every single day or making very long trips, some of these features might be a very real and important thing to them because they see on a regular basis. You know, I don't commute every day on my motorcycle from I'm in the Silver Spring, Maryland area and I work in downtown DC. I see a lot of instances where some of these technologies definitely benefit me if I happen to be momentarily distracted when another vehicle pulls out in front of me. Someone who is taking shorter trips, just going out on the weekend, um, going to track days, you know, on the, the bottom image there is of a motorcycle race. They may not want any of these features because they are in a controlled, safer environment and are using the motorcycle to its fullest extent. And part of that is the challenge of operating without some of these uh, safety features. Um, and some of that too is also the added cost and complication, um, whether it's riding on a racetrack or in the dirt, um, you want, you may end up on the ground in a you know, typically safer environment, or at least in the dirt at lower speeds. And a more expensive motorcycle with more features is something that you may have to fix more often if you're riding in the dirt and sometimes ending up in the ground. Um, a smaller, cheaper, simpler motorcycle in some situations is what all a rider wants. They want a simple thing they can pick up and ride. Um, that other motorcycle in the image there is uh, another a bike I was able to borrow um, when I was in California. Well, I didn't really take it off road very much. I did pull it off in the dirt there to take that picture. Um, but it does go to show, you don't know, that is a street motorcycle that is designed to be used in dirt as well. So having the ability to adjust ABS helps a lot. So some riders who are gonna spend a lot of their time in a situation where ABS may not be helpful to them are gonna be a lot less interested in paying the extra money for it, or will avoid a motorcycle that doesn't allow them to adjust or switch it off when their riding situation calls to do so. Um, and Eric pointed this out as well. 
some riders overestimate their skill. And I think Lee Wolf um, can address that very well as a trainer. Um, I certainly probably have been victim to that as well at certain times. Um, they've made it so, you know, however many years riding without the need for this. So why do I need to go out and seek it now? Um, I think there are a lot of ways to uh, encourage folks to consider using these features. Um, as we have a theme between Eric and mine's presentation, a lot of these features are becoming more and more standard. Um, in some situations, these features are actually increased performance, which might be a sales thing for some folks, some riders to consider them. Um, and I think emphasizing that emergency use of the feature um, is really important. Uh, an anecdote I have from a, a, a motorcycle safety event, one of, an engineer from one company that makes some of these features was speaking to this audience um, and a member of the audience chimed up and said, my kid will never learn to, uh, will never ride a bike with ABS. And you know, it was kind of shocking to me and the engineer said, that's fine. We never want you to have to use these features. They are there and the say it's a safety net because you know, maybe on a track you're paying 100% attention 100% of the time. It's just not reasonable or humanly possible to do so on the street all the time between differing road conditions, differing traffic conditions. It is very challenging to have that level of attention so the well-trained rider can perform 100%, 100% of the time. So having this backup is really important. And to me, that was that was the message that worked really well for me because I, I know my close calls have been in times where I let myself get distracted by an object on the side of the road, an animal or something like that, and I didn't notice something else happened in front of me. So that is really important. Um, the ability to adjust them to suit rider needs um, in different riding modes. Um, many motorcycles, mine included, has different modes for different situations. Mine, um, I can speak to you best because it's the one I ride most of the time, um, has a sport mode where some of the intervention is turned down and some of the performance feature um, options are turned up. It has a touring mode where it's kind of a middle of the road and an urban mode where some of the power uh, is turned down because you're in a urban setting, you don't necessarily need it. Um, and more the intervention of the safety features is turned up because you're probably in a higher density area as far as differing conditions, whether it's a wet manhole cover, some construction or some other thing happening in front of you, having a little more intervention goes a long way. Similar modes in other motorcycles will often be a rain mode to help um, uh, increase the level of intervention of something like traction control and, and ABS. Uh, the, the video Eric showed of uh, testing a motorcycle on a wet surface, you can see just how well ABS works in that. It's also, I think, a very effective selling method to convince riders just how important that is. Um, and again, in certain off-road sessions, you know, the other mode on my motorcycle is an enduro or kind of an off-road mode and uh, it adjusts those doesn't fully turn all the, these features off, but adjusts them to work in a way that is most appropriate for a low traction environment, such as dirt, gravel, or something like that. And for somebody who is less experienced off-road, I certainly am grateful to have that. Um, and I included these images here, largely because I believe it's important for riders to note that, or the larger safety community to note that riders will always want control. We do not want a motorcycle that's going to ride itself. You, you know, there's a BMW that BMW have developed to ride by itself. You, I believe you can go find a video of it riding around a parking lot and coming to a stop. And then the other, there is a uh, robot that Yamaha developed to sit on and operate one of their motorcycles. The uh, riders get on a motorcycle for, you know, experience freedom to recreate, commute, uh, in a more uh, competition or uh, close course setting to experience, you know, test the limits of their skill in those close course uh, environments. Um, and things that get between them and the control of the motorcycle are probably always going to be a hard sell. So the adjustability, the ability of a rider to tune these things to their preferred settings, to their preferred riding conditions and adjust them as needed, I think helps bridge that gap between rider control and safety uh, technology. Um, and with that, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for having me. Mike, thank you so much for your presentation and bringing the rider perspective. I think you definitely showed that safety is not one size fits all and that, that great reminder that um, road users all have unique needs um, and challenges when they're on the road. So thank you for that. And of course, the importance of consumer education um, so that they do accept the technologies that are available um, to improve safety. 
Our next and final speaker is Lee Parks. Lee is an internationally renowned motorcycle professional and president of Total Control Training, Compass Kinetics, and Lee Parks Design. His involvement in the motorcycle industry includes being a safety program manager, curriculum developer, vehicle and product tester, instructor, trainer, racer, and PPE manufacturer. He has authored more than 300 articles and shot more than 2,000 photos that have been published in both consumer and trade magazines and websites. Lee is also a three-time best-selling book author and has been an expert commentator on CNN and Open Road Radio. Welcome, Lee. Thank you very much, Stephanie. All right, uh, glad to be here. Great, uh, great panel of guests we have here. So uh, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach here and talk about safety from a rider training perspective. So specifically, what does it mean to create a culture of safety? And that starts with education, but that also includes, as we'll talk about licensing, as well as moving up to lifelong learning. So starting with making a cultural change. What, what exactly is a cultural change? Well, according to Merriam Webster, it's the modification of a society through innovation, invention, discovery, or contact with other societies. And I wanna go just really quickly over a list of some examples of cultural changes that you guys should all be familiar with, at least in terms of in the world of health and safety. Uh, smoking, that's probably the biggest cultural change we've seen certainly during my lifetime. Helmet use, you see that most recently in skiing, snowboarding, and, and now bicycling, seatbelt use, drag racing on the street. Uh, that's now turned over into professional racing with things, groups like NHRA, NASCAR, uh, drinking and driving, hitchhiking, condom use, and the nutrition facts panel. That's one of the more interesting ones. Uh, you know, it would be unthinkable now to go to a store and buy food or drinks without knowing what's actually inside of it in terms of uh, nutritional guidelines and ingredients, and that didn't happen until actually 1994. So these are all examples of cultural changes we've all experienced. So specifically when it comes to creating what we call a safety culture, a safety culture is a broad organization-wide approach to safety management. And those organizations can be anything as big as a country uh, or even global to a region, a state, a club, even to the training sites that uh, are all over the country. And it's also a safety culture is the end result of the combined individual and group efforts towards the values, attitudes, goals, and proficiency of a safety program. And we're gonna get into the details of that as we go along here. So I think when it comes to making a cultural change, at least in the motorcycle training uh, industry, the most difficult challenge that we've had is not so much just a change in the training methodology, although that is definitely an important part of it, but it's also a major shift in different riders' attitudes towards that. So I want you to think about how much bikes have changed in the last 40 years. So you've heard the, uh, the prior panelists talking about some of the new technologies that have come out in terms of the electronics, ABS, et cetera. Well, as a good example, I want you to take a look at what was considered to be pretty much one of the top performance bikes in 1967. It was the Suzuki X6 Hustler. This was a little 250 two-stroke vertical twin and uh, I remember when I was researching this bike, when I was doing some uh, vintage racing with it, uh, the original Cycle World magazine review of it. And although I may not have the world's best memory, sometimes you see something once and you remember it forever. And this is what the test said. And I quote, the Suzuki X6 Hustler does the quarter mile in a scorching 14.9 seconds. Clearly, this is not a bike for beginners. Now, we may all sort of chuckle at this right now, because it's hard to find a bike that's that slow nowadays. Even training bikes are mostly faster than that. Uh, but the human condition has not changed in the last 40 years. We're still the same sort of floppy meat bags we've always been trying to control these motorized vehicles. But take a look at a new modern sport bike. I'll just use as an example of BMW S1000RR. This is a motorcycle that can do the quarter mile in less than 10 seconds. It's faster than virtually all but the most expensive of super exotic cars. And this is something that can go 
pretty much close to 200 miles an hour right out of the box. And you don't even need a license to be able to get one of these. So our expectations for what new riders should be capable of, of controlling out of rider training has vastly changed since the 1960s, even though we as a species have not changed. And a good way to think about it is that riding a modern motorcycle is really much more akin to aviation, to flying an airplane than it is to driving a car. So to think about this, think about how rigorous flight training is compared to bike training. So motorcycle training, you can do in as little as two days, get your endorsement and be off and running on a thousand cc sport bike, a heavyweight touring bike or anything in between. Flight training on the other hand is an order of magnitude more amount of hours that it takes before you can fly even the most simple airplanes. So this brings up what I like to call the fighter pilot dilemma. So in other words, how do we get pilots to get to the pinnacle of performance, to get to the top level, the most high performance aircraft as possible? Well, they have a saying in the Air Force, there are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there are no old bold pilots. So in rider training, our goal is to try to make everybody into old pilots. So to do that, like uh, in the Air Force, we subscribe to the crawl, walk, run philosophy of training. And so as an example, when you go to get your private pilot's license in something like a 152 or 172 Cessna, that's really just the starting point for one day being able to get to something like an F-16. And there are many intermediate steps between there. Similarly, basic training on a motorcycle is just a starting point for modern motorcycles. And no matter what curriculum you're taking, no curriculum in two days can teach you how to safely pilot a thousand cc sport bike, a heavyweight cruiser, et cetera. And so that should also be done in stages. I know in other countries they have tiered uh, licensing and uh, I know Americans are not a real big fan of that or graduated licensing, same thing. So really if, if it's not gonna happen legislatively, this is something that we have to do uh, on our own volition as riders. So our goal in rider education is to get riders to realize the skill it takes to safely operate modern motorcycles. And the reason that's important is they are much more complicated than a car to be able to act uh, precisely. And they have much more severe consequences when things go wrong. And the consequences aren't just for the rider. It would be great if the only person who ever got affected was the person who got into that accident or crash or uh, situation, but the rider's friends, family, co-workers, other riders, so many people are affected by uh, simple collisions. Uh, we've all heard experienced people say, hey, I've been riding for 20 years, I'm a good rider. Well, maybe they're a good rider, maybe they're not a good rider. Do they have 20 years of experience where they're actually learning and getting better each year? Or as is the case with many people that we see, do they have one year of experience that they've simply repeat, experienced over 20 times in a row? So a lot of people will say, well, practice is what's most important because practice makes perfect after all, but practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. Only perfect practice makes perfect. So unless riders know what they should be working on to go towards true mastery of their bike, all they're doing is reinforcing their bad habits as they ride more. So let's talk about some of the proven drivers of change that we've seen to affect uh, creating a safety culture. The first one that we found is by raising the standards for student licensing, we can have much better results in terms of student outcomes and safety at the end. The reason is new modern bikes require a much higher level of proficiency. And so the first thing that we did was we increased the number of miles and exercises in class. So previously I'll use California as an example, but it's the same as most states in the country. Um, there was an average of 12 to 16 miles ridden in a two day beginner class. Now, that we've switched to the new curriculum, we ride between 22 and 35 miles now, because no matter how good training is, there is no replacement for seat time. Braking performance is also an area where we've seen a huge improvement versus the prior program. So as an example, at uh, Camp Pendleton, which is the largest Marine base in the world, we looked at the data from their skills tests from 2014 to 2015. In 2014, the average rate of deceleration was 0.612 Gs. In 2015, with the improved curriculum and standards for uh, the instructors as well, which we'll talk about next, that went up to 0.835 Gs. Now that technical jargon may not mean anything to you, so let's sort of put that into the real world. Well, what that means is at 15 miles an hour, our students were stopping 3.3 feet shorter than they had previously. 
Well, that's the difference between hitting that bumper and not hitting that bumper. At 30 miles an hour, a typical speed you'll have on normal city streets, that means they were stopping 13.2 feet shorter. If you extrapolate that to 60 miles an hour, that's 52.9 feet shorter. That's almost a semi truck worth of length that our students were able to stop compared to the previous uh, curriculum. And it was really just a matter of raising the standards for not just the students, but also for the instructors. It was a combination of better technique and a philosophy that basically said we're not uh, interested in getting students to the minimum standards, because when you think about it, the minimum standards are really just a hair above failure. Our philosophy is we want students in the allotted amount of time to get as far past the minimum standard as possible. And that's part of how we were able to get these incredible improvements. So similarly, we, uh, which was not something that had been done previously, were brutally honest with the students about the risks of riding. And this is a video we're gonna show you uh, that shows you part of how we teach the students about what the risks of riding are. Motorcycle riders face many risks from other road users, roadway surface conditions, even the weather. Riding safely means recognizing and managing these risks. When motorcycles crash, 96% of the time the motorcycle is the striking vehicle. This means the motorcycle is running into another object, including stationary objects such as trees, guardrails, and the ground, if no other vehicles are involved. About 80% of motorcycle crashes result in the motorcyclist being injured. Compare that to about 20% for car crashes, and you see just how vulnerable motorcyclists are. Recent fatal crash data suggests that riding a motorcycle is actually 38 times more dangerous than driving a car, in terms of fatalities per mile ridden versus per mile driven. Some good news is that the risk can be significantly reduced if, for instance, you always separate drinking alcohol from riding. You can further reduce your risk by taking intermediate and advanced motorcycle training classes in the future. Another way to reduce the risk of riding is to wear quality protective gear. Remember, riding gear will not prevent all injuries. It can prevent some injuries, though, and reduce the severity of any injuries that might occur. So in addition to being honest about the risks of riding, we also teach students how to manage fear. And we do this from uh, sort of biological uh, point of view so that they understand how fear manifests itself in your brain and what you can do to overcome that. It's also really nice because it helps you in all areas of your life, not just in overcoming the fear of riding a motorcycle. We also showcase new safety technologies. You heard several of the prior panelists talking about some of the new technologies that are out there on the bikes themselves, but there's also a lot of cool safety technologies that are coming out in the, in the world of gear. So as an example, one of the things that we talk about are some of the new helmet technologies that are coming out. In this particular uh, example, I'm gonna show you one of the helmet manufacturers, uh, in this case, 6D has, instead of just a single layer of EPS uh, liner to absorb impacts, because those are only good in direct hits, it's got two separate liners with a little rubber grommet in between that not only acts as a shock absorber, as you'll see here, but it also allows the two EPS liners in every direction, forward, backward, side to side, et cetera, to move independently of one another, which can help reduce the amount of G-forces on your brain in those critical thousands of a second where the impact happens. So the other part of raising the standards is also for the instructors to be licensed and to be recertified. We have significantly more prerequisites for them. We provide professional development workshops where they're actually riding on closed circuits, where they're actually, to actually able to operate at real street speed so they can see how these techniques work in the real world. And they're also required to do additional training every year so they can continue their lifelong learning uh, journey. Uh, we also require the instructors to model the behavior that they teach. So as an example, anytime a student sees an instructor either riding to the range, riding demos, or riding away from the range, not only do they have to have a, a DOT compliant helmet, but they have to have a motorcycle specific jacket, gloves, uh, boots, as well as durable pants. Because the worst thing that you can do to a student is to lose your credibility by 
preaching safety and then not exhibiting that yourself in your own writing. Also uh, taking another um, page out of the aviation training handbook, we make our curriculum improvements the same way they do in software. And that is all the curriculum is electronically based. So anytime we get new data, new research to suggest a better way to do our teaching, we can instantly put that into our curriculum, upload it uh, to Dropbox or, or another cloud-based system, let everybody know to download it. The next day, everyone's got the new updates. And those happen, they could be every few months, uh, it could even be every few weeks, depending on if there's something really important that we've learned. It's also been proven uh, to make a difference by promoting and offering intermediate and advanced training. Because the big deal here is if you don't fix the existing riding population, you're only putting more and more new riders out on the road. Of course, fatalities are gonna go up because we've increased the base of the pyramid. So a lot of effort we, we spend and we encourage other people in the rider training industry to uh, put in is really promoting and offering those intermediate and advanced training opportunities. Why is this so important? Well, in the military back in 2009, they looked at their fatality data and they noticed that there was, depending on the branch, a 37 to 61% reduction in fatalities for uh, military riders who took follow-on training versus the control group. And so in the military, it's easy to make these kinds of changes because the students will jokingly say they were voluntold to be there. Uh, another good example is in Pennsylvania, when we started taking over that program, uh, they have free follow-on training and that includes advanced training. And this is for anyone that's a resident, anyone that has a Pennsylvania permit or endorsement, even track-based training. We've got uh, eight events this year on actual tracks where we're able to take people out at realistic street speeds, teach them advanced uh, collision avoidance maneuvers and uh, cornering and braking and throttle control techniques. And we're able to do that completely free of charge to Pennsylvania residents. That's just an amazing uh, thing that that state has decided is important. So for the rest of the country though, since we don't have the taxpayers paying for it uh, with endorsements and uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, licenses, we have to encourage that. Whoops. Sorry, I lost my screen here. There we go. All right, so just to see what kind of results we've gotten in California in the first five years of changing the curriculum and the program management, we went as a state from a year on year increase in fatalities of 12.1% year on year increases. Once we switched to the new curriculum and the new program management, we had a year on year decrease of 1.54% in terms of the fatality trends. And why this is so significant, especially in California, which is the largest state in terms of motorcycle ridership, is in 2019 alone, by reversing those fatality trends, there's another 356 people that are alive today because of those changes that we were able to make versus the continuation of that trend. And there's no reason to think as, that it would not have continued as it has in other states. Same thing in Pennsylvania, the first two years that we took over the state program there, we also saw an immediate decrease in the fatality trends for motorcyclist fatalities in that state. So as a conclusion, I wanna make an important distinction between skills and judgment. So one of the things that we teach our students is that an expert rider is somebody who uses expert judgment to avoid having to use expert skills. And to do so, we need to make a commitment to lifelong learning, not just for the instructors, but for everybody who rides uh, in this country. In Total Control, we have another saying, we say, amateurs practice until they get it right, professionals practice until they can't get it wrong. So in other words, we want you to treat your riding career just as seriously as you do your work career, where you're also probably getting continuous improvement training so that you can continue to be uh, a better employee as well. So my challenge to everybody is to ask you the question of what are you going to do differently this year versus last year to help create a safety culture in your state or organization. 
If you have any questions, you can reach me over here. Otherwise, thank you guys very much. Lee, thank you for your presentation and for the emphasis on training and how that really should be a lifelong effort um, when it comes to, to these uh, riding and, and I think the same for, for driving anytime new technology and, and different things are introduced in, um, we can all benefit from learning how to use them properly. All right, thank Mike, you. I am uh, happy to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. I want to thank all of our panelists once again for your presentations, and I want to thank everyone behind the scenes who helped put this event together. I hope today's program has given you an insight into the safe system approach to improving motorcycle safety. It will take all of us working together from crash investigators to researchers, educators, law enforcement, to policymakers, and to riders to get it to get us to zero deaths and zero injuries. Before closing, I wanna share an important message to my fellow riders. We are responsible for our safety too. If you're looking for a new motorcycle, please consider one equipped with automatic emergency braking systems. Learn how your system works and understand its limitations. Wear all the gear all the time. If your next road trip includes a stop and some drinks, plan for a sober ride home. As a fellow rider, if you're a fellow rider and your group is having drinks, speak up, take the keys and find them a safe sober ride home. Thank you for turning into our a Safe System Approach to Motorcycle Safety webinar. Together we can save lives. Thank you.